Art 101C uh, 422, and we're going to learn about America in the 1950s following World War II. As you know from the last lecture, the United States won World War II, liberated Europe from the likes of Hitler, and Japan was beaten by the United States using the atomic weapon. So remember, as we look at this era in the 1950s, the specter of this mushroom cloud, which, can you see that okay on the left, Michael, the mushroom cloud? Not the whole, okay, now it's rendering. There yeah, there there's a little bit. Of the internet's catching up now, all right. So the specter of the mushroom cloud looms over the era that we're gonna look at today. And I think it's still today, we still have the mushroom cloud as sort of the backdrop of the civilization where our destructive powers are very much understood. I know my parents grew up in the 19, you know, were your age in the 1950s. They remember the Cuban revolution and the fear of uh, World War III and having to sit under their desks uh, during air sirens uh, when there might be atomic weapons flying. You can just imagine that, that fear. Um, so really, that's an important backdrop to 1950s, and of course, the fact that the United States won World War II. And we're going to shift now to look at how, to, how America um, uses illustrations and artwork to help sell products. And consumerism is a major defining attribute of American society and the world as it Americanizes under the umbrella of the American empire during the 1950s. So remember, Europe is devastated by World War II, as in crumbling, in crumbles, in, in, in pieces, and the United States is intact. We didn't have any war on the home front. So we become the dominant um, and only sort of superpower in the world, including the United, or I should say, and the Soviet Union. Uh, so let's focus on the United States and look at the artwork and the, uh, how artwork was enlisted for uh, selling products and illustration in the 1950s. And you can see here just a quick little snapshot of some of the art movements in, the, in this era. And we're really sort of in the 1945-1960 era, um, but we're gonna see artwork that's not really in the fine arts realm so much as artwork in the popular culture realm of consumer society. So Michael, what do I mean by consumer society? I think maybe these pic pictures might help you uh, answer that question if you need any. Um, well, it's certainly, uh, we reached, a point in time in that particular in the 1940s 50s where things we were comfortable enough and the economy was stable enough where luxury items became a thing and people had disposable incomes that they could then use for television sets nice looking sofas washing machines pretty Lamp, clothes curtains don't forget the curtains the curtains, whereas before it was like, we need to make sure we have money for food. Yeah, and so no, great, great, really important to understand, great, Michael. So before this era, remember the entire, the entirety of human history is a story of struggle against nature, struggle against volcanoes, against plague, against earthquakes, against, give me some more. People who want to shoot you. People who want to shoot you. People want to eat you. Animals who want to eat you, right? Early humanity is about animals that want to eat us. A lot of scientists have now figured out that humanity evolved probably because of the pressures from predators like saber-toothed tigers that made us work together and our brains get bigger to, and eating meat and whoever knows, fire and all these things. So pressures from nature that made us sort of evolve into who we are today. And we still have these pressures in the form of pandemics, for instance, right? That force us to work together and sort of use language in our brains to figure out how to survive in the face of adversity. And we now have maybe a, a, a sense of complacency, which is sort of a comfort, a sense of ease, because we don't have perhaps what we think is as many adversity or as much adversity or as much, uh, as much pressure uh, to survive, because we now have much more, a much more comfortable civilization than we ever had in the entirety of human history. And part of that comfort, part of that uh, ease comes from the convenience that technology provides us. So as we pointed out, or Michael kind of pointed out, this whole living room is much more than just kids watching TV. It's all these consumer goods, which are part of a globalizing economy that brings everything you might need to your doorstep, including information, news, culture, pop culture in the form of television. So television leads the way, um, right, you know, after radio, perhaps, the printing press 
comes before the radio and TV, but it's all part of this sort of exchange of information using technology. Technology is really always gonna be the, the game changer throughout history and will continue to be so, and our values usually follow technology. So for instance, here on the right, Ramy, are you there? Yes. So what's going on on the right? What, how, what technology are we looking at on, in the picture on the right? Uh, a dishwasher? Yeah, a dishwasher. How do you know it's a dishwasher? Because it looks like there's water and it's like this little machiny thing and she's in a kitchen. Yeah, great. Exactly. So you're, you're collecting all the data and extrapolating the right sort of understanding from the data you're collecting, right? It looks like a kitchen, tiles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've got maybe a, a sink. She could be washing clothes. She could be washing dishes. But we, we know, su suffice to say, it is a machine. And what is the machine doing apart from uh, washing dishes or clothing? What's the bigger thing that, the, that the, this machine represents, Ramey? Uh, making life easier. Right, making life easier. And why might that be important in terms of, say, gender? And gender, as we all know, is sort of the social expression of your sexuality, right? The, the roles of male, female, as they've been historically defined, right? So yeah. how might that relate to gender, technology and gender in this case? Um, are you talking about like feminism? Yeah, it yeah, could be. It um, doesn't, doesn't need to be that, but sure. I don't know how like machines would relate to that though. Okay, that's it, great, that's great, is, that's great. I mean, you see a woman in the kitchen and like that's so stereotypical, so I get that part, but. Right, okay, good, let's use that as a starting point. So the, the typical roles, and I think going back to the point Michael made about us having to survive in the face of scarcity, right? Us mm -hmm. struggling to provide for ourselves, knowing that, that men die from, root, uh, from, from dental problems early on, that diseases kill us early on, that women die during childbirth. This is all before the modern era. But because of modern advances in medicine, technology, we don't necessarily have the same adversity or same uh, threat from nature, from, from, from existence, right? And yeah. technology is a big part of that, right? We are able to travel further. We're able to know things. We have electricity. This is sort of, we are the fruit of industrialization. So let's talk about how that relates now to gender. So before the modern era, you could arguably say that human beings have specialized roles, male, female, um, like on farm labor, even in factories. My grandmother didn't work in a factory. She was a housewife. My grandfather worked in a factory, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, um, you know, both of them wouldn't have even considered an alternative reality because that was sort of what they had to do in order to kind of make things work in that situation that they had economically, socially, but, and that was before I think the technology arrived to really liberate people from those roles. So let's really drill down on what I mean by like technology as like a liberating force. Um, let me get someone else chime in here. How about Anna Harris, are you there? Yes. So how does, how do you think technology, in this case, perhaps even the woman on the right washing dishes or clothes, how might that relate to uh, transforming gender roles? What does, uh, what does this machine represent? Uh, going back to what Ramey said, uh, it, rep it represents convenience, right? Sort of the ease and how to- why, that aspect of them staying home and st while the husband is working. And, and how does this machine change that housewifery? Because they don't have to go anywhere. It's all in the comfort of their home. Uh, be a little more specific. Think about how did people wash clothes before this machine was invented? Outside. And? By hand. That's the key part, by hand, right? Yes. Why is, why is that important? Because now a machine's doing it for but, them. But why is it, why is it uh, important that we did it by hand before? What's the, what's the, what are the, is that, why, why not still do it by hand? Why didn't, why wasn't that something people, why did they want machines to do it instead? It took a long time. Right, it took a long time. So what does a machine give, for instance, this woman right here? More time with their family? More time, just more time, more time. And more time means you can do other things with your time, right? And so yes. in this case, we could think of technology as something that frees women up from the duties, typical duties that they had. And this, this is true for men, you know, machines do the factory work and men don't do the assembly of cars anymore, machines do it. 
And you could see how technology is a force for good or bad, depending on how you want to define it. But I think in this case, we would all agree, agree that having machines spare people from the labor of, of kind of boring, dull, repetitive tasks is a great thing. And it really starts transforming gender roles. So keep in mind, as we look at the sort of 1950s, which is a very interesting era today, that technology is a thing that changes people's values. It's not values that change per se on their own, but rather technology that changes society in a way that allows us to have a whole different value uh, and evaluate what the roles that people want to play should be. And a lot of women enter the workplace partly because of the technology that's liberating them from the sort of traditional role, but also as we saw during World War II, a lot of women enter the workplace because of men are off fighting war. And oddly enough, you know, a lot of these women who had a taste of that sort of working went back to sort of traditional domestic roles in the 1950s following World War II, but were understandably probably not very happy going back to sort of like once a parachute opens, it's really hard to close it, right? So it's sort of a, you can't really make people get back into an old role once they've experienced the sort of joys of this new role. So that's really going to be an important theme today, how technology transforms society. But specifically in this case, we're going to see how consumer culture and art uh, uh, collaborate to produce pop culture medium or media like books and magazines that really sort of narrate the sort of consumer culture of the 1950s and selling products. And the landscape will be a little sexist, um, but you'll see by the end of it, there's a really sort of, you'll, you'll I think be able to see the changes that occur and how technology and consumerism relates to that. So we're gonna watch a video that I think does a great job showing the uh, wonderful illustrations uh, that artists make in, at the service of consumer culture in the 1950s in the United States. So let's go ahead and do that. And can you hear this okay? You hear that, Michael? The piano little thing? All right, here we go. Oh, and can you see it? Oh, you can't, yeah. No, wait, now I, yeah, I can't see anything. Oh, here we go. There we go. Now, can you see it? Yes. Right. Yeah. Throughout its relatively short history, American illustration had always been dominated by images which demonstrated extraordinary levels of painterly skill and representation. And despite the rapid encroachment of colour photography into the popular media, this continued to be the case in the 1950s. The camera could faithfully record the subject, but the skillful illustrator could provide visual personality and tricks of exaggeration and emphasis in ways that the camera could not. And no one demonstrated this better than Norman Rockwell. He had risen to prominence in the 1930s, and by the 1950s, he was easily the best known illustrator in America. We're going to see more of his work after the video, so keep that in mind. His immense popularity was as much to do with the warm hearted, patriotic ethos of the work as his skill as a painter. Although he used his immaculate brush technique to make his pictures seem real to the viewer, most of his characters' anatomy and posing were actually exaggerated caricatures. And Rockwell wasn't the only successful traditionalist. His arena had been primarily in magazines, but Haddon Sundblom was better known for his advertising campaign work. Coca-Cola wasn't his only client, but they were by far the biggest and most profitable. His depictions of this rosy-cheeked Santa Claus in particular have proven to be enduring iconic images on a global scale. His illustrations were uniformly breathtaking in the hyper-realistic skill he demonstrated. But Sunblum's reputation was based more on close-ups and single-figure work than on the complex groupings frequently found in Rockwell's images. Do you notice the importance of branding and brands? Brands are a key part of pop culture, consumer culture. And the reason why branding is so useful is because when you go to Starbucks, you expect a Starbucks cup of coffee to taste the same way it does everywhere else you go because you want a standard product because that is what you expect. And that's the whole point of branding, to give you exactly what you are familiar with and to expect that familiarity. 
Sunblom was also in demand for his rather coy pin-up art, and his stylistic approach had an undeniably powerful impact on the man who was to become the most popular pin-up artist of all time, Gil Elvgren. Although he had begun his career as another immensely talented all-purpose illustrator for advertising and publishing, by the 50s, cute females in varying degrees of undress were his only subject. Although it borrowed heavily from Sunblom, there is real vitality in Elfgren's painting, and he built on a Sunblom classic technique of varying the precision of his brushwork to focus and control the viewer's attention. Like many illustrators, he photographed his models to get the posing and lighting he wanted. But he wasn't hidebound by it, and added exaggerated, lightly caricatured features to produce hyper-realistic results. Elvgren's pinups were in demand for any number of advertising programs. So very sexualized, immediately you see that. And, and do you think that the artwork, the, the, what we call it, commercial artwork advertisement from before the 1940s, before the, like the 1930s was as sexualized? No, so very much sex is a big part of sort of this new American culture. And they're sort of using sex both to sort of uh, pander to sort of the, the male gaze, the sort of men, but also to the women as sort of a, a way to sell products to women too. And that's gonna be something that is an oddly um, uh, effective way of of transcending a lot of these barriers we're going to see because the people who are selling the products really don't care about your gender. They just care that you're buying their stuff. And so there's an oddly merit based sort of element to capitalism where instead of sort of preserving the old boundaries, as long as you're buying stuff, they're happy to sell it to you. And you're going to see that shift as we go through the decade of the 1950s. But almost all his work was commissioned for corporate wall calendars which were hung with enthusiasm by American males in offices and workplaces across the states. Which would be very uncomfortable for female co-workers to see, of course, that it's sort of setting the stage that, that will change. Albert Dawn's illustrations always showed great empathy for his fellow humans, and he used good-natured humor to draw his audience in and engage with the subject. He was no less skillful than the other realists, but some of his illustrations were deliberately less painterly and relied more on linear expression. With Dawn in particular, it's easy to see that his characters are wildly exaggerated for maximum humorous effect. And Dawn was fond of frequently arranging his figures on virtually empty or at least selective backgrounds, giving them greater visual clarity and definition. The graphic energetic work of Al Parker must be classified as representational, but he had a far more adventurous approach. He worked in a wide range of media and took chances with some degrees of abstraction and posterization. This gave his work a more distinctive, less painterly look and maximized the graphic clarity of all his illustrations on the page. So the artist, the narrator is pointing out the fluctuating interest in naturalism or abstraction or cartoon, a cartoon visual vocabulary. And so artists are really enlisting all the history of art, all of what we've learned as a civilization to sort of use color and movement and naturalism or not to sell things, to, to illustrate stories in magazines that sell things. It's all the service, not of uh, illustrating Jesus or the Bible, or promoting kings and queens, or even uh, dictators or whatever. It's to sell products to people. And that's still what's really, I'd say most of the artists today probably are, are working to help sell things to people who want to buy uh, products and make life easier. As such, he was something of a hybrid and demonstrated that versatility could have its merits too. Of course, not all representational illustrators were as skillful as those at the top of the pile. Movie posters in general, and particularly B-movies and driving films of the horror and science fiction kind, offered up some spectacularly cheesy imagery. Similarly, America had an insatiable appetite for racy novels, also known as pulp fiction. And these paperbacks were invariably sold... Shriek with pleasure. ...featuring covers as lurid and provocative as the stories they contained. Comic books featuring superheroes such as Superman and Batman had first appeared a decade earlier. 
But the 50s saw massive explosion in both the popularity and diversity of subject matter. There were westerns, crime, science fiction, horror, and even religious comics published. There you go, there's a updated Jesus in comic book form. Jack Kirby had created the highly successful superhero Captain America in the 1940s. So it's not without irony that in the 1950s, Kirby found his greatest commercial success with teen girl romance comics. Back for just a moment. Abigail, you there? Jack Kirby had created the highly successful superhero Ed? Captain America. Who is uh, Captain America punching? In the 1940s. So it's not without irony. Um. Hitler? Yep. Yeah. Did Captain America fight in, in, in World War II? No. Yeah, is there a Captain America? No, it's just resembling America. Yeah, so who, yeah, who is Captain America? A superhero personifying America? Yeah, great. Well, nice answer. <laughs> Thank you. In the 1950s, Kirby found his greatest commercial success with teen girl romance comics. Kirby is rightly seen as a crucial figure in the development of comic art. But it has to be conceded his drawing was rather stiff and simplistic. There were others who were far more adept with a brush or pen, including Frank Frazetta, whose early comic work displayed an organic energy and precision far superior to that seen elsewhere. And Wally Wood was every bit as meticulous and created some of the finest examples of comic. So I want to just point out some of the marvels of Wally this, Wood of how. Uh, what they're doing with this medium. Alejandro, are you there? Yeah. So what's go is that what's the weather in this cartoon in this comic right here? Um it's raining. And how do we know it's raining? By like the lines. And like, so what do the lines represent? The rain like falling to the ground. And is that how rain kind of looks when we see it? No. I mean kind of like it's as close as like you definitely see raindrops falling and and something that falls really fast on a on one lo linear trajectory. If you kind of look at it, it sort of, you know, shoots down just like a meteorite. A meteorite has a line, right? Yeah. So I just point out the, this, this artist is using a very simple technique, a line, a diagonal line, not a vertical line, a diagonal line to show the way rain falls, the movement of rain. Very clever use of lines to capture movement and atmosphere, right? It's sort of like a, a, a triumph of the simplicity of a line to capture much more than what you would expect a line ever to be able to capture. And you might also notice something else, the use of contrast, black and white, to really make the subject pop against a more darker background here. It was every bit as meticulous and created some of the finest examples of comic art in the period. Unusually, he was able to hop between realism and cartoon humor with apparent ease. And he demonstrated this with his contributions to Mad Magazine. First published in 1953, Mad was the brainchild of cartoonists Harvey Kurtzman and Bill Elder, who was soon joined by a list of other cartoon worthies, such as Wood, John Severin and Jack Davis. In its infancy, the magazine was relentlessly manic, almost exclusively in strip format, and poked fun at all aspects of American popular culture, including other comics. That's like Shazam, a, a spoof on Superman. Shazam is, would be like our version of spoofing Superman. It was an instant hit with teens and young adults, and paved the way for the underground comics of the 60s. Although Mad was an entirely new concept, comic strips themselves had featured in newspapers since the end of the previous century. Peanuts by Charles Schultz made its debut in 1947, but in 1950 it was syndicated across America, and this is when its popularity went off the scale. Schultz's drawings were minimalistic and non-representational, even by comic strip standards. And he's basically non-representational means not naturalistic. As with all the best scribbly illustrators, his characters managed to be real in the viewer's mind. Peanuts was easily the most successful of all the comic strips of the period, but there were plenty of others enjoying success, such as the laconic humor of Walt Kelly's Pogo Possum and Al Cap's raucous hillbilly series, Little Abner. 
but nobody else seemed able to match Schultz's ability to draw so little and say so much. What's he saying? So let's use that as an example. Uh, 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 Alejandro, what's going on in this picture? Um, like the case of Al Capon, like the dog is holding him. And what's the dog's expression? He's mad. Why is he mad? Because he's like a trying to, I don't know. Um, well, if, let's say you were the dog. Why would you be mad? Because you don't want to carry him. One, that's number one. Absolutely. You don't want to have, be just the equivalent of a, a crutch, right? Holding him up. And number two, what does the dog want to do? Uh, play. And so why is he also mad? Maybe he wants to like uh, read the book he, he has or something. I don't know. Oh, you're on the right track. I don't think it's quite it. So my rabbit is dirt is right over there this whole time. And he's probably thinking the same thing. Why can't we play? I want to play. But in this case, it's even worse, right? Because here we have, and for those who don't know, that's my, my pet rabbit, of course. But here we have Snoopy, who wants to play with, with who is he, Charlie Brown? But instead, yeah. Snoopy is relegated to being like the equivalent of a chair, right? You follow? Yeah. And so Snoopy, I guess he's angry because one, he wants to go play outside with Charlie, but Charlie's more interested in the book, right? You could make it even more agonizing by making it a book about a dog. That would add another layer, I think, of, of comedy. But you could see the point that the narrator is making is that the artist here has reduced, simplified a message to its bare bones and easily digestible. So it's much more than just, it's not about how good the artist draws or how skillful they are, but how skillful they are at sort of making an image that's easily digestible visually. So and for comic value in this case. And you notice we don't see much comedy in art throughout the history of art. And that's usually because art is for sacred purposes, for religious purposes, for celebrating powerful people. And you don't make fun of them per se. And we could, you could say we've seen some satire, but especially in sort of American culture, we sort of see the total informalization of work, of artwork, which I, by which I mean artwork becomes sort of vulgar, uh, open to anything, anything goes. And that's partly because we're just selling products with artwork, partly that we're not selling or we're not um, conveying a religious message. And in a way, you could say pop culture substitutes Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever, as a sort of new unifying uh, belief system, or visual system, at least. With hindsight, the most significant aspect of illustration in 50s America was the unstoppable rise of a group of illustrators who had little time for painterly detail and realistic anatomy. They took their inspiration not from the old masters, but from the abstractions of Picasso, Matisse, and Miro. We'll, we'll learn a little bit about that on uh, more about these artists on uh, Friday. Jim Flora was arguably the prime mover in this modernist style, and was best known for the remarkably distinctive and idiosyncratic jazz album cover art he produced throughout. So I know he said it, but Logan, what are we looking at here? Matt, are you there, Matt? Matt Solms? Yeah, sorry, what'd you say? W what are we looking at? Um, it almost, it looks like orchestras, like books. Like uh, not quite right, nope. <clears throat> Next, uh, Steve, how about you, Steve? What are we looking at? It looks like vinyl covers. Wait, explain what that is. Explain what a vinyl cover is. It's like the case that vinyls come into play. <laughs> but, but tell people what vinyl is. Does everyone know what vinyl is? I hope so. Prob I'd prob I'm going to assume maybe one or two don't. So just tell us what vinyl is. It's like what a CD was before CDs came out. Yeah, they were called record records and they were, I think, made of vinyl. I don't know why the vinyl, I'm not even sure what vinyl is, honestly. But I think they're called vinyl because that's another word for records, right? Records that you play on record players, right? So what are we looking at? What's inside these things? records right yeah. so these are like album covers for record records right I, I know you might know what that is matt I'm, maybe you just kind of didn't recognize them because we don't really have these kinds of things anymore and i gotta tell you when i was growing up i looked at my brother's record collection and it was there was nothing cooler than opening up a huge album and looking at all the great illustrations and all the lyrics and all the wonderful things that that accompanied this sort of consumer product which is a musical uh record record and that, as you said, uh, it became CD players, right? Or CDs, that's what it turned into, Steve. And now, what are they today, Steve? Um, now it's, they're just virtual on like 
iTunes and Spotify and SoundCloud, so it's just like a single picture on a virtual uh, screen. And it's not something you have in your hand, right? It's not like, oh. ooh, ooh, I'm holding this thing that I like, right? And there is value to have some, having something in your hand, right? If, if, mm -hmm. there, if there's any doubt, just think about dating someone online versus only talking to them <laughs> online versus talking to them in person, male or female. You're going to want to have something in your hand eventually, right? person's heart or whatever person's body somewhere so yeah you never know if you're gonna get catfished yeah you never know you never know but there certainly there's a, there is a huge change today where now music is in the air and it's online oh. and it's free and consequently we don't really have albums anymore we don't really even have much of a music industry anymore so uh this is really a for me a sad loss because i think albums album covers were a really wonderful part of growing up for me because i love seeing all the illustrations and the pictures the 1950s. Flora's illustration was bizarre, playful, comic and occasionally sinister and he cheerfully ignored all aspects of traditional illustration. From 1955 onwards he wrote and illustrated a series of groundbreaking picture books with the same crazed visually challenging approach. There was the fabulous firework family in 1955, the day the cow sneezed in 57, and 1959's magnificently titled Charlie Yup and His Snip Snap Boys. Those are some creepy illustrations. These books were the first real signs in America, at least, that illustration could bear little relation to reality and still have meaning for young readers. And at precisely the same time, the startlingly similar work of Cliff Roberts started making an appearance. Like Flora, Cliff Roberts' fascination with music was a defining feature of much of his work. His radical monochrome illustrations were used to great effect in the first book of jazz, published in 1955. Jazz is an American invention by American Black, so it's absolutely an American sort of uh, musical genre. Roberts generally used colour sparingly and with complete disregard for anything other than its decorative power. However, this seahorse image for Ford Motors is a clear indication of what he could achieve if so motivated. Roberts was adept in many creative pursuits and worked as an animator and character designer for the equally modernist UPA Animation Studios. That both Cliff Roberts and Jim Flora entered the public's consciousness at the same time solidified the idea that this was a whole new stylistic movement and those striving for painterly excellence should watch their backs. Children's publishing in particular fell for this new style virtually overnight. In their lifetime, Alice and Martin... The importance of ch children as a cultural sort of leader today companies sell things to children because they know they'll influence their parents to go buy them. So in a way, we've sort of, even children are now sort of major players in the sort of consumer culture that we have today, as you guys all well know. Provinson illustrated more than 40 picture books together, half of which they also wrote. They had been a couple, both romantically and professionally, since the early 40s, and by the 50s had become immensely popular. In 1952, Martin designed the first, now virtually unrecognisable, version of Kellogg's Tony the Tiger. But it was their book work together which really made their reputation. Although broadly speaking they were stylistically in line with the modernist stance, their images used abstraction and colour to make highly decorative and charmingly innocent narrative illustration, which held the young reader's attention. Mary Blair originally worked for Disney Studios, producing concept art for Cinderella in 1950, Alice in Wonderland in 51, and Peter Pan in 53. So it kind of brushes over that, but that relates back to what I was saying earlier, that you're going to see women entering the workplace, and you know he doesn't even make, uh, skip a beat just mentioning female illustrator working for Disney. And of course, there's no reason why women shouldn't be illustrated, because they have just as many abilities <coughs> with art as men do, so you can see Women are entering the workplace as artists, just like as we know today, the world now is almost uh, much more, or is much more equal as far as uh, opportunity than what we saw in the early 1950s, where women were still sort of like an ob object to, with which we, they sold products like Coca-Cola. 
A stylistic influence is strongly felt in those films, even if Disney backpedals somewhat in the final productions from Blair's more enthusiastically geometric approach. She left Disney in the mid-50s and began working as a freelance illustrator, creating artwork for any number of advertising campaigns. But it is her children's illustration which has proved to be her most enduring legacy. As with the Provinsons, despite its geometric angular styling and virtual absence of perspective, there is real delight in humanity in all her work and an equally sensitive approach to colour. Avind Earl also joined Disney Studios in 1951 as a background artist. Just to point out, so you notice how the Disney artist drew those trees there? More detail on the trees in the foreground, less detail on the trees in the background, and that really pushes them back a little further. So very clever cho choices by these artists to develop a visual vocabulary for this new sort of medium, which is animation. Studios in 1951 as a background artist. In 1953, he created the decidedly avant-garde look of Toot, Whistle, Plunk and Boom, a short animated film which won an Academy Award. He worked on several other Disney productions, but most memorably he was responsible for the radically modernist styling and background art for the highly acclaimed Sleeping Beauty. Like Mary Blair, Earl's work had naturalistic aspects, but was dominated by a resolutely abstracted approach to form and colour, producing a strikingly memorable and visually satisfying hybrid technique. Look at how beautiful that is. Perhaps the most extreme and revolutionary of the modernist illustrators of the period was Abner Grabov. He had been working as a commercial artist and designer for a few years beforehand, but he came to far wider attention in 1954 with the success of his astonishingly radical... Notice the colors there. Uh, uh, Matt, Matt, are you there? Yeah, I am. So what kind of colors do we see here? Uh, kind of bright colors. Very bright, and that definitely is important. Like Children love bright colors. If there's any doubt, just look at the cereal aisle in the supermarket, right? And yeah. what, what, how would you, in terms of what we know about the color wheel, what kinds of colors do the artist pick here, right? Uh, primary. Right, mostly primary, like, and a little bit of like green, like to be a complement yeah. to the, right, good. And so, and we know those are the colors that have a lot of contrast and they pop. And so there's a sort of, the artists are enlisting what we've learned throughout art history, but here maybe for selling children's stories, but also for selling products. These colors are very bright and they are eye-catching. <laughs> 